Hi, welcome to the Semantics Lecturelette on Unaccusativity. Unaccusativity represents one of the most important discoveries in argument structure that have ever been made. And the, and the discovery is simply this, that not all intransitives are alike. Essentially, some of them are, have one argument that behaves like a subject, and others have one argument that behaves more like an object. And there are a wide variety of grammatical and semantic patterns that uh, distinguish these types of intransitives. So it began uh, with a paper by Perlmutter, Perlmutter uh, involving relational grammar. And uh, he noticed that certain intransitives in Dutch could take a passive, but others could not. So the, the, the verb um, swim could take a passive, but the verb drown could not, for instance. And so based on that, he you know, ended up distinguishing different, uh, different uh, intransitives. And the term that he used are still used today. So instead of just simple intransitives, we have two types. The first type is called the unaccusative. And these are the object-like ones. And the other ones are called unergative. So essentially, you can think of them as in the object position, but not the object. And here, we can say in the agent position, but not the agent of the verb. They're just a single argument. So ergatives, if you recall, are the uh, subject of a transitive. So it behaves like the subject of a transitive, but it's an intransitive. Here, it behaves like the object of a transitive, but it's an intransitive. Hence the name. So unergatives and unaccusatives, uh, this is a distinction we find in language after language. But each language has its own way of distinguishing these predicates. So in English, uh, there's a good uh, number of them. Um, I'll talk about some. So unaccusatives alternate with causes alternate, have the alternations um, that we saw earlier. So um, ex one example is close. Say the door closed. That's an intransitive. But it alternates with the transitive, I closed the door. That works for a verb like close. It doesn't work for a verb like run. You can say, um, I ran the race. You can say, I ran, but you can't really say, Bill ran me, and you can't really say, the race ran. Those don't work. So ran, run, I should say, would be an unergative. Close would be an alternation. Unergatives, on the other hand, do allow what are called cognate objects. So a good example is dance. You can say, I danced a dance. That works just fine. You can't really say um, that I fell a fall. Right? Fall is an unaccusative, but dance would be an ergative. Another example is that um, unaccusatives can be... Um, Modifying participles. So, for instance, again with close, we can say a closed door. But you can't really say a danced dance. That's weird, right? Or um, um, you can't really say a, a swum backstroke, something like that. Um, you can so you can you can say you know a fallen tree, you can say a closed door, uh, you can say um, a sunken ship, but you can't say a worked linguist. You can't say uh, a sung singer, or, and so forth. So um, a modifying participle works for unaccusatives. Does not work for unaccusatives. 
Um, also, unaccusatives can be used with expletives. With uh, there. With a there subject. So you can say, a classic example of unaccusative is arrive. You can say there arrived a boat. That's perfectly grammatical. But again, with sing, you can't say they're saying a choir. Now, it's tricky because this is the their expletive. If you use the inverted locative expression, there, at that point, saying a choir, that's okay. So you really have to be careful with that one. Okay, that's, that's English, right? And there are some other uh, examples as well, right? Unaccusatives allow uh, resultatives. So these are modifying expressions that express the state that the uh, subject was in at the end of the event. So if you say the vase broke into a million pieces, into a million pieces is the resultative. You can do that with break. It's unaccusative. Right? It has the alternation. I broke the vase. Modifying parsibles. The broken vase. Used with there, eh, there broke a vase is kind of weird. Right? So this one, not the best test. But you can do that. Can't really do that with, uh, um, with an ergative. You can say, I, I sang, you can't say, I sang horse. Or I sang sick. In fact, you have to put the reflexive. I sang myself horse is fine. But that's not an intransitive anymore. I sang horse is bad. I danced tired is bad. So these do not take those. Okay, so that's, that's the English, and those are some tests for English on accusatives and on ergatives. In uh, other languages, we get different tests. So in Romance languages, for instance, uh, we often get auxiliary differences. So if you've studied French or Italian, you probably have noticed that some verbs in the perfect or the past you know, will take have as the auxiliary and others will take be. The reason is that the be verbs are unaccusative. So in French you say, je suis tombé, I have fallen, but you use the verb be. So fall in French is unaccusative. In Italian you would use uh, be for a number of verbs as well, which I don't know Italian so I can't really give them to you. Um, and then the unergatives would have have. So you'd say, Le navire a coulé. The boat sank. A coulé. Um, with have. Now, as it turns out, um, French is a little restricted. There are some unaccusatives that use have instead of be. But um, if it uses be, it is an unaccusative. So all be verbs in French are unaccusative. In Italian, all unaccusatives are be verbs. Unregulatives are all haves. In both languages. Another example in Italian involves ne criticization. Um, won't go into it, but it's a common one. You can look it up. So these are pretty strong tests. Uh, another one, the one from Dutch, is that um, intransitives that can be made into the passive are an accusative, and the ones that can't are an Okay, so wide variety of tests, they're very remarkable, very reliable, and they represent an interesting distinction in the syntax as well. So the basic idea is that these characterizations aren't just semantic, that they're syntactic, that the unaccusative is an uh, the argument in, it, it starts not in the subject position, but in the object position. That's why I can do these things. Whereas the unergative starts in the subject position. So we actually have distinct syntactic patterns for unaccusatives and unergatives. And that's where the distinction comes from. And this also leads us, you know, this leads to some other facts as well. There's a famous case of Bertzio's generalization. And Bertzio's generalization is simply that the complements to verbs only get accusative case when there is a distinct subject. 
So a non-ergative will get um, you know, non-ergative case because it's you know an agent's a subject. But the unaccusative, even though it's in object position, will not get accusative case because it can't get accusative case, there's not a distinct subject. It's in object position but it is the subject of the verb, so it will get nominative case too. All right, so when we have unaccusatives, we have unergatives, we distinguish intransitives this way. You can use these tests, they're not always 100% perfect, but they're almost 100% perfect and they're extremely reliable for a number of languages. And if you're exploring a language that hasn't really been uh, described in too much detail, especially on the semantic end, one thing you can do to try to figure out which intransitives are unaccusative and which ones are unergative. And so this is a distinction that we'll be using a lot that um, is essential for understanding argument structure of, of not only intransitive, but of verbs in general.